Well, good morning and welcome. Would y'all stand with us as we begin to worship together? We're gonna praise our King for what He's done for us. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. The great things we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, I say.
Good morning, Eagle Church. If you believe it, put your hands together. Amen. You can have a seat. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here today because we get to spend some time with one of the favorite people in my life. When I met Carl Ralston several years ago, he's been an inspiration. He and his wife, Lori, have had such an impact on me personally and have been a good friend of Eagle Church for a decade plus. So I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage the founder and president of Remember New Ministries, Carl Ralston. Carl, good to have you, brother. Thank you. Great yeah. to be here. He's been with us many times, and uh, I want to reset for many in the room. Some of you know the name Carl Ralston. Many of you do not. So part of the goal today is to have a conversation to give you context to how one of our really strategic mission partners has happened and taken place. And it's been started primarily with the work of God in Carl and Lori's hearts. So I want to turn the clock back. We're going to jump in. 2003. Here's a picture. 2003 from Carl and Lori, and they were in Ohio, and he was leading an insurance agency business at the time, and God inserted a pretty profound experience in that context. Talk about that a little bit. Great. Yeah, I got the opportunity to go to Chiang Mai, Thailand on a vision trip with Christian Missionary Alliance, and they flew in missionaries from all over Asia, and they told us what God was doing in each of their countries and the very last missionary that spoke was from Cambodia. And he talked about child sex trafficking. And if you're like me, I had never even heard of that topic then. And he told some of the statistics and it was pretty overwhelming. But then he said, here's a positive story. This is a young lady named New. And he showed a picture of these four girls and knew was the tallest in the picture. And he talked about how she was a Vietnamese refugee living in Cambodia. She became a Christian, was going to their school for the Vietnamese. And he talked about how she shared her faith and got baptized. And as he was doing that, I was relating to New as my sister in Christ. And I thought, this is so cool. Here I live in Akron, Ohio, and literally 12 time zones away is this young lady. Now she's 14 years old, named New, and she's my sister in Christ. And I was an only child, and for whatever reason, I think it was the first time I really related to somebody being my sibling mm. in Christ. And as I did that, I had been going through the dark night of the soul where it seems like God's silent in your life and I had been going through that for 11 months. And just about that time, as I was sitting there, the international worker said that uh, he had a medical issue that he had to come back to the States. And while he was gone, New's family had carried out a threat and sold her to a brothel. And in that moment, God broke those 11 months of silence in my life and just impressed upon my heart, remember New. And I just became overwhelmed with what was happening to her. And uh, I knew God was changing my life. And you're 42 years old at this point. So 42 years old, you're running an insurance company in Ohio, you're trucking along with life, sounds like dealing with some dark night of the soul stuff. You get inserted into this experience, right? You have this moment where you just knew God was doing something, specifically in relationship with this young lady sister in Christ named New, and some things started to shift, right? Imagine when you came home and started talking to Lori about the experience, right? There started to be a discussion about maybe the next stage of your life was going to be less insurance agency, Akron, Ohio based, and more what was really the seeds of a ministry called Remember New. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, when I came back home, I had been praying and asking God what he wanted me to do with my life. And within about a week, I was one morning in my living room and I was on my knees praying and I just said, God, until the day I die, I will do everything within my power to stop children from being used in this way. I didn't know what that meant. Mm. I just knew that I couldn't continue living my easy life in Akron, Ohio, knowing that this was happening, that children were locked in rooms as sex slaves 
And so I was finishing a master's degree at the time at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, just north of here, not too far. And I started doing research to learn what people were doing to help children and what they were doing toward ending child sex slavery. And as I did that, I realized that's what God wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And you went back several times, right, to Thailand. You went multiple times over the course of the next few years, right, to find new, right? And I think we've got a picture of, like, I think it might have been close to the age of when you guys, right, that's a picture of new in her teen years, right? So yep. maybe just set for everyone kind of the context, because you kept going back, right? It wasn't an easy, you had this one trip where you felt like God impressed remember new on your heart, but there were return visits to Thailand, right, to, to find new. Yeah, yeah. I didn't meet New, I just saw the picture of her, and I had asked the missionary if they could find her. They thought they could. I said, could you buy her out? He said, yeah, but you'd have to pay the money that her family was given and her room and board. That's how they trap them, is building this big debt. And I just gave him my card and I said, if you can get her out, get her out. I'll give you up to $20,000 to get her out but he didn't find her. And so about six months later, I took my first trip looking for new. And I had learned by then that 90% of the Vietnamese refugees either lived along the Ton Le Sap or the Mekong River in Cambodia. And so I just took this picture I had of new and walked up and down those river banks looking for her and asking people if they knew any of the children in this picture or if they knew how I could find their families and I ended up taking six trips to Cambodia over a two and a half year period before I finally found wow. her. And she became the, fa the first really member or employee yep. of the organization, right? First employee and maybe talk about that because she got inserted right into a whole, some doing something different with her life, right? Yeah. Uh, when I met her the first time, I told her the story, told her my wife and I wanted to help her, and she wasn't real open. She didn't know if I was there to abuse her, and so I left because I didn't know I was going to find her on that trip. I went back a few months later, told her that we had started this organization and we were going to help 15 children from her very neighborhood where she was sold and I explained to her that we wanted her to help and teach our older girls cosmetology. That's how New avoided being trapped permanently in the sex trade. She convinced her family to let her learn cosmetology. And so when I did meet her, she was working in a salon and it was uh, five minutes till 8 a.m. on September 19th, 2006. She said, can I ask a question? And I said, sure. And she said, when can I start? Mm. And uh, in that moment, I lost every bit of energy because I had cried out to God so much for this young lady. But I knew in that moment she'd be okay. I knew that we'd get her the best medical care that money could buy. I knew she'd never be sold again. And so she became our first worker that day. So at this point, the insurance agency life, you'd closed up shop, literally sold a lot of things, most everything, got a storage unit, put the rest in, right? Yep. Is that a picture of? That's correct. And then you relocated to that area for a while, right? You were living in? We lived in Chiang Mai, Thailand for about five years. Yeah, to get this thing off the ground and get it going, and then you since relocated to the West Coast from there. But in the stats, Carl, help us with, I believe you consistently have said around a million children a year. Is that the the general statistics that are released are sold into some kind of sex trafficking? Yeah, when I first learned about the story, one million children a year, they estimated, were entering the sex trade for the first time. And now that number has actually went up to 1.2 million children a year. Wow. So it just seems so overwhelming, you know, when you hear that. And talk about how you, because you went back to school, I think we had a picture of you graduating, you know, you got your master's, you got your doctorate. Yeah. Check out Carl with his doctorate degree here. It's pretty <laughs> impressive, right? There's, we call him Dr. Ralston now. So he goes back to school because it was really important to you to understand and do the heavy lifting of 
getting an understanding of what to do about this big problem in the world. And so you get your master's degree, you get your doctorate degree, and you have this concept of prevention. You believe the offensive energy burst to solve this issue is prevention. Right. And that is a really important part to understand, like Remember News Ministry. And maybe you could just talk about how you are attempting to do something about the 1.2 million. Yeah. Uh, I realized as I learned that when you get a child out of the sex trade, most organizations have 70 to 90 percent of them go back. And I learned finally after two months of reading that some people were doing prevention and prevention, over 95% of those children are never sold into the sex trade. Mm. Prevention costs about a tenth of the money that intervention costs. And I realized if I was a child, I would want you to prevent me from entering the sex trade, mm. not come rescue me 10 years down the road. And so prevention became the model for Remember New. And we do that a few different ways. One way, especially when we started, it was the most prominent way, was to start homes for children where you found a child that was at risk, removed them from that at-risk environment, placed them in a home, did things to make it a home and not an institution. And that served Remember New for a long time. And those children, only a few out of thousands, uh, ended up falling prey to the sex trade. Now we've got a picture, just so you, I know you're gonna hit these other points. We've got a picture of Simpson family in 2016. We went and visited, we took a trip to Thailand and we went and visited, show a pic, pic of us up here. So we went to Thailand and there's a picture of us in the children's homes. Yep. And we're playing a lot of Uno and the girls are painting a lot of fingernails and there's all kinds of games happening and Kendra's pumping up the Colts all the way across the other side of the world <laughs> there. So way to go hunt on that front. But it's just a picture, right? We took our our family there because we wanted to come alongside and support uh, the vision of this concept of pulling kids away into a home that was safe, it was a warm, welcoming envir environment, and it gave us a front row seat. And many of you who've taken Remember New Trips, you've had your own kind of front row seat to what's called a children's home. And that was one of the key strategies, right? You like yep. pull them there, raise them up, education, vocational training, eventually they graduate, right? Yep. But that's not the only, talk about the other pieces on the prevention. Yeah, the world's changed uh, since that time, and now many countries won't let you start children's homes. They want you to do foster care, so we do that inside the church with only Christian uh, foster care parents. We do that in some countries. Sometimes the environment is okay, but poverty is going to drive the child to the sex trade. In those situations, we'll uh, do a scholarship to prevent them from being at risk. And most recently in Bolivia, we started a pilot program called Family Restoration, mm. where we will work with a family where we see a child at risk and we'll go in with a social worker, determine what's causing the child to be at risk, and then we'll attack those specific problems. Maybe it's the fact that the dad's an alcoholic and the mom doesn't have a skill to earn income. Mm. And so we'll work with the whole family. And I see that as being a potentially uh, good solution for child sex trafficking prevention. And so here's a map of the scope of Remember News Ministry. So you started officially 2000 and what was the? Seven was the first home. 2007, so 15 years into this journey, there, there's your statistics, right? I've got 117 homes in 16 countries, 2,250 children have been prevented from entering in. Right. Right? How about that? That deserves a round of applause right here. Come on now. That's, praise God for that. And so Eagle Church, one of the things we're doing is we've got a trip on the calendar planned for January to go down there to Kenya in Africa because there's some work going on down in Kenya, right? Yep. And uh, maybe say a couple things about if somebody jumps into that trip, what that might be like. Yeah, I tell people if I could videotape an entire trip and you would watch every minute of the video, you would still not get the experience that you get in going. There's something that I think God does that his image is in these children. And when you look in the eyes of the child in their country, 
they really steal your heart. And so I would encourage you, there's nothing better than sitting down, seeing a child that you know was destined for the sex trade, and now they're in this happy home and sitting there playing hopscotch or volleyball with them or playing a game of Uno. It really is a life-changing experience. Yeah. So you have an opportunity to connect more with that. You can talk to Lacey and the missions team folks connecting with Carl and Lori afterwards. But that's practically, we say, hey, what can I do? You could go and be a part of a trip and get a front row seat to that. And then maybe talk about the child sponsorship structure because I know through the last 15 years that's evolved and there's some different stages of sponsorship. Kendra and I and the Simpson family, we've had the privilege of sponsoring a couple of different girls through the years. It's been so meaningful to connect in that way, but maybe just break it down for folks, just how they can be involved that way. Yeah, the major way Remember New is funded, we don't take government grants, um, but we do it through individuals like each one of you who sponsor our children. And we have that broke down to three levels because people are in different financial positions. You can be a parent sponsor at Remember New. It involves giving $60 a month. You can be a cousin sponsor, which is $40 a month or a sibling sponsor, which is $20 a month. And those funds pro provide for all of the child's needs, food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education. It covers everything for them. And we've got a picture of you uh, with Chup Lee. Do I pronounce that right? Chup Lee? Because yep. she's one of the first graduates of the program. She's one of the first girls in the home, right? Yep. And she entered in 2007. Maybe say a couple things about her. Yeah, great young lady. Uh, when she came to us, she was in that group of 15 young ladies that we saved from News Neighborhood. She was a good friend of News. And this is her just a couple of years ago. She's now early 30s, married, has two beautiful children. And uh, that was one of my greatest joys in my life mm. was I think you can just see the love and... Um, affection that she had there. She gave us a little doll for me and one for my wife. And it was kind of a reunion that we did with that group of 15 girls. And uh, she just has a warm spot in my heart. And in the village she was in, over 70% of those children were being sold into the sex trade, and she for sure mm. would have had a very different life. She's married. Mm. Uh, all of those girls but one are married, and none of them have got divorced, mm. and they have a very good life now compared to what they would have had for sure. And um, tell us about the spiritual impact. I thought about like what you've seen is many of these girls come, and they might not have a ton of Christian background, especially some of the areas, right? primarily Buddhist in some of the Thai areas, and, but just the spiritual impact you've seen as the girls have come and participated in the ministry. Yeah, this is part of God's plan. Uh, at Remember New, we're in many countries that are 95% Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, animistic, atheistic, and in our homes across all of Remember New, over 90% of our children have become Christians, and they're strong Christians. They're leading people to Christ, neighbors, mm. family members, other children at school. So it's a great joy of mine to be involved in that and mm. see these children's lives saved, not only in this world from the worst fate imaginable, but for all of eternity. Amen. They will be with us in heaven, and uh, we'll get to visit with them. One of the most beautiful scenes. Of, yeah. yeah. So one of the most beautiful images I carry from our trip to Thailand was our worship experience we got to have on Sunday morning. We were there over a Sunday and to gather with all those kids and um, just to see their passion and their joy and their just surrender to Jesus in the midst of circumstances it's hard for us to put, you know, in context here. Um, but last question, how about New? Tell us about New. Got a cool picture of current life for her. Yeah, New is my daughter in my heart. I'm her dad, and uh, we have the privilege to live very close to New. And she moved here, and on May 8th of 2016, 
married a fine young man in Hawaii on the beach. Mm. His name's Gabriel. He adores her mm. and uh, treats her very, very well. And on June 21st of 2020, she gave us the great privilege of an uh, amazing granddaughter named Catalina. And if you ever talked anew, the thing she repeatedly said to me over the years was, Dad, I just want to have a normal life. Mm. And what she meant by that was a husband and a child mm. and be safe. Mm. And she has that. And she's about the most beautiful picture of God's redemption and amazing plan for our lives that I've seen. Amen. Eagle Church, that's why we do what we're doing, right? Let's stand. Would you stand with me? I just want to pray a blessing over Carl. You know, we often talk around here about as your life gets linked up with Jesus, you get linked up increasingly with what's on Jesus' heart. And when you read these scriptures and you see what's on Jesus' heart is the marginalized, the overlooked, the oppressed, the often forgotten. And uh, those have a, a prioritized focus of Jesus' life. And the closer you get with him and the longer you walk with him, the things that are on his heart increasingly become on our heart. So this should be normal Christian life, church, that when we hear about 1.2 million children being sold into unimaginable conditions, followers of Jesus say, that shouldn't be, we got to do something about it. And this is our way as a local church. We're trying to put our offensive energy in partnering with a ministry who they know what to do about this. I mean, we don't know. We just know we want it solved. We want to come alongside a ministry like this, organization and a staff like this and say, hey, so I want to encourage you. Get connected to this group. I vouch for it with my whole heart and the work that they're doing and the way that they're going about it. I just don't think you're going to regret saying yes to that. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for Carl and Lori. I thank you in 2003 that you would drop them into the middle of Thailand to expose them to a reality um, that literally has changed their lives and now rippling out to change thousands and thousands of others. So thank you for their wholehearted yes. I just think you never know what one yes to Jesus will turn into. So thank you for their yes and their continued surrender. And we just pray your blessings over the Ralstons, over their marriage and family, over their ministry and the work of their hands. We pray that you would raise up many more laborers to come alongside from house parents to financial supporters to administrative help to everything that's needed to someday we long to be able to stand and say there are zero children being sold into this sex trafficking. Like we just pray for that day when 1.2 1. million goes to zero. So raise up, remember, new. thank you that you have raised up this ministry to do something about it. Thank you for 2,250 children that have a story much different uh, than what it would have been. And so we pray your blessings over them. We pray your blessings over Remember New. And then just give us, Lord, as a church, say, what would you have us to do? Help us be sensitive to you and say yes and amen to whatever it is you ask us to do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. One Thank more you. round of applause for Carl. Thank you.
break the unbreakable and so Lord I just pray that people who don't know you like we do learn who you are your love your grace your unchanging love and grace Lord I pray right now for maybe someone who heard Carl and his story with remember knew that if there's something um, moving in them that that is your Holy Spirit Lord and that they listen to your spirit and they move. Take that step of faith, of courage, knowing that you go before all of our uh, steps and we can trust you in that. Lord, help us be hearers and doers of your word. And so as we listen um, and, we, uh, and we move, that you are in those, um, those next steps that we might take after hearing from um, your word today. We love you, and it's in your son's name that we pray together. Amen. Good morning. I'm Susie Jordan, and I've been around Eagle Church since 2004, served in various ways in children's ministry and through missions, and now I have the privilege of being a small group leader. The scripture text for today is Romans 8, verses 26 through 28. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Thank you, Susie. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. So glad that you're here. If you didn't get a chance to get the notes on the way in the door, um, you can pick them up on the way out if you like, or feel free to get up there on the black tables there. Welcome to everyone joining us online. The online host can guide you to some message notes there. We're in this series on the life of the Apostle Paul. We've been in the book of Romans recently. We've come to Romans 8 today, and there's a question that's kind of in the background of the second half of Romans 8. And the question goes something like this, and I think he addresses the question in the verses we're looking at today. The question goes like this, says, how can a Christian face the sufferings of life with overwhelming confidence and deep assurance that all of the struggle will be worthwhile? Okay, I'm going to say that question again, because this is the question that's running in the background of the second half of Romans 8. 
that we're going to dive into today. So how can a Christian face the sufferings of this life with a overwhelming confidence and a deep assurance that all of the struggle will be worthwhile? Paul's response to that question is three things. A future hope, the Spirit's help, and a sovereign God. A future hope, the Spirit's help, and a sovereign God. So a future hope is found in verse 20 and 21. The verses just preceding where Susie read for us says this. says, for the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope, underline that, in hope that the creation itself will be, notice these words, liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So the the future hope can be summarized this way. The way things are right now is not the way they will always be. That's the future hope. So for Paul and for anyone in the first century who was uh, grounded in a Jewish faith tradition, they would have seen time in primarily two ways. The twofold understanding of time was this present age and the age to come. So this present age represents Genesis 3 until now. Genesis 3 is when Adam and Eve fell into sin. So this present age embodies what, what Paul says here in Romans 8 when he describes it in frustration, in bondage to decay, this present age, right? In poverty, in disease, in famine, in injustice, in children being sold in unimaginable conditions, in evil, in darkness, in death. That's this present age, That's what's scrolling the news feed right across the phones and the headlines day after day after day. We don't need a ton of commentary on this present age. What Paul wants to say is we've got to look at a future, the age to come. So here's what embodies the age to come. In the language of the New Testament, called a new heaven and a new earth. That's what Jesus referred to it as. It's a place of the no longers. There's an age to come where there'll be no longer any sin. There'll no longer any pain. No longer children being sold. No longer any broken relationships. No longer any cancer or Alzheimer's. No longer the grief that comes with goodbyes. There is a time to come when everything will be as it's supposed to be. That's called the age to come. And I like what John Eldridge, I put this quote in your notes. John Eldridge describes this age to come, this future hope. He, he tries to unpack, what's that going to feel like? He says, it'll feel like a 10-ton weight being lifted off my being. Follow this now. To be utterly free from accusation, to look in the mirror and hear no accusing thoughts or voices, to be completely free of all temptation and the sabotage of your character, not because you're successfully resisting it in a moment of great resolve, but because it's no longer in existence. How glorious is that going to be anywhere in the world? What will it be like to have the dark clouds lifted between us and our beloved Jesus, that veil that so often clouds our relationship with him? Imagine When all the physical affliction, emotional torment, abuse, all the evil of this world has vanished. That's the age to come. So here's what Paul says in Romans 8. Here's the future hope. We take two hands and we grab a hold of that future hope and we put, with everything we've got, we grab a hold of the age to come and we anchor it now to ourselves and our soul in this present age. That's the future hope. We grab a hold of that and we bring it into this now here. That's what Paul's saying. Because this is not the way it's always going to be. There is a day coming when this doesn't look like it looks like today. That's the future hope. And that's how the Christian, that's how someone who's following Jesus, that we're supposed to live with these like two lenses on reality. Our feet are firmly, firmly grounded in today. We live today in this present age, but we also live with an eye towards the age to come, the future hope, when things aren't the way They are right now. So when you're sitting beside the bed of a loved one whose body's fading away like many of you have been doing recently, when you're walking through another round of chemo, when you're trying to mend a broken relationship only to find in that mending you just deepen the hurt and fracture it all the more, when the pregnancy test comes back negative again and again and again, when the job ends or the marriage ends or the ministry dream ends, 
when the ache strikes deep down. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. In that moment, Paul says, with two hands, grab a hold of your future hope and bring it now as an anchor to your soul in this present age. That's the first move of how a follower of Jesus is to find and face the sufferings of this life with confident assurance that it's going to be worthwhile. It's a future hope. And then he builds on it now with the Spirit's help, the verses that Susie read for us. In the same way, verse 26, notice the Spirit helps us. Did you see that? In our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with groans and with words cannot express. Look at verse 27. He searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So the Spirit's help is this Holy Spirit interceding for us on our behalf. Have you found the circumstances in life yet where they simply take your words away? There are circumstances you'll hit in this life that you just can't muster the words together to express. That's what Paul's saying. The Spirit's going to step in and help that way. And the, the word he uses for intercede there in your Bibles In the original Greek, it literally means it's a person bending over to help someone in a time of need. That's the interceding. That God bending over towards us to help us in a time of need by the Holy Spirit. It reminded me when Lily was four years old, and we had this wonderful idea as a family because Kendra was very pregnant with Kaylin at that time. We're going to go to the water park. I think it was in Plainfield. And we had this great day planned. And dad spotted this water slide that I was convinced Lily was really going to enjoy, right? Dads, you have those moments, right, where you're just like, man, you just know your kid's going to love that water slide. And Lily was freaked out about that water slide the entire day. But I wore her down through the course of the day. And, you know, towards the mid to late afternoon, I said, honey, I think this could really be good. And I, I talked her into going up to the top of the slide with me. And then I talked her into, like, talking to the worker. And when I got up to the top of the slide, and she finally decided, okay, I'll go down the slide with you, Dad, the worker says, sir, this is a child-only slide. No parents allowed. And the worker was, like, 12. I mean, he talked to me in not a great tone. I'm like, dude. So I said, can we make an exception here? Like, I've been working on this all day. And Lily's eyes are like really, really big. And she's sitting, you know, on the water slide chute where the water's rushing out, you know, right there. She's just sitting there waiting for dad to kind of get behind her. And I said to the worker, I said, okay, here's the deal. I said, you hold her here. I'm going to run to the bottom of the stairs, get to the bottom of the slide. And then when I get down there, let her go. Now pause for a minute. (laughs) Moms, I know wisdom at that moment would have been to simply, you know, get Lily and just say, hey, we'll just do it another day. But I'm pressing beyond wisdom. I'm going for courage right now, okay? Or stupidity, maybe some of you would say. So the worker, who's 12, looks at me and says, okay. And so I take off running down the stairs. And I go and I zigzag my way down the stairs and I get to the bottom of the water slide only to find when I look at the bottom of the slide, I just see Lily's two feet sticking straight up. (laughs) Bottom of the slide, her feet are sticking straight up and the water's like, you know, just keeping her under the water. So I jump in the pool, and by now there's like two or three moms who have come to the rescue, and this one mom like reaches down, grabs Lily, holds her up like this, and is scanning the pool area. And she looks at me and says, is this your child? And she just had appropriate condescension, like, and judgment. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I can't represent just the tone and the look, like, are you her father? Yeah. And Lily's just got the four-year-old. His eyes are just so big, blinking, and you know, the water's just rushing. Like, what has just happened to me that's so traumatic? Now, on the other side of the water park is my beautiful wife, laying, soaking in the sun, just basking in the thought that her husband is taking wonderful care of their four-year-old daughter. <laughs> so we go back to see mom, which is where Lily definitely needed to be at that point, and she comes up to mom and Kendra's like, hey, how'd it go? Lily clearly looks like she's had a little bit of trauma in the water, you know, on the outside. And Lily's catching her breath to the point now where she just says, Mom, I went down the water slide. Dad did not catch me. Scary. And then she's bawling like this. She looks at me like outstanding, you know. (laughs) Way to go, Dad. 
But I thought of that image, you know, of that, that mom who reached down into the waters for a lily. Some of you feel like, some of you have come in this morning and you feel like four-year-old Lily and the pressures of this life have you pressed under the water line to the point where it's just your two feet sticking up out. You can't see through the next five minutes, let alone the next day or week. And, and Paul says, you know, sometimes in this present age, you're going to hit seasons of life that you're just... You're so covered up and you're under the pressure and you can't even, you can't imagine how you're going to get through what you're going through. And Paul says, the spirit is, God's going to bend over by the Holy Spirit, reach down and grab you and hold you and pick you up. The imagery is one of groaning. Do you see that term groaning? The spirit groaning. Have you hit a stage in your life yet when you haven't been able to put the words together to express what you're going through? All you can do is groan or moan about it. Here's the promise Paul says for a follower of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you will never groan alone. Oh, come on, church. How great is that? You're never going to groan alone because God says by the Holy Spirit, I will be there. I see. I hear. I understand. I will groan with you and for you. I will intercede. I will bend over and clutch you and pull you to the surface as the Spirit's help. Do you see that, church? So how can a Christian face the struggles in life that seem so overwhelming at times? How can you do that with a deep-seated, confident assurance that it's going to be worthwhile? The first thing is you got to take two hands on your future hope, and you got to grab it with two hands, and you got to drag it in as an anchor into this present age. And remember this, the way it is right now is not the way it's always going to be. And you anchor yourself there. And the second thing is you hold on to this, the Spirit's help. You and I will groan. It's clear from the life of Jesus and the storyline of this book that he's left us. We will groan. There's nothing about following Jesus and equal exemptions from sufferings. Pretty good argument to be made when you choose to follow Jesus, they get multiplied. Resistances included are multiplied. And you perhaps might multiply your groaning by choosing Jesus, but here's what the promise is. You will not groan alone. The Spirit will be there. He will help you. He will intercede for you. He will carry you. He will bend over under the surface and pull you up. And that leads us now to the third element, right? Future hope, the Spirit's help. And thirdly, a sovereign God. Because some days, right, <laughs> have you found out in life like you thought the light at the end of the tunnel only to find out it was a train? Anybody been there? The deep valley just gets deeper. The darker day just gets darker. <laughs> what do you do then? Here, here's what Paul says. Hey, future, hope, spirit's help, and now huh, a sovereign God. Verse 28, and we know that in circle, all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So a sovereign God that's a declaration of the Lord's power and authority and resources to work things out, all things out, for a greater and more glorious purpose than often we can see in this present age. Notice he didn't say that all things are good. He said that he'll work all things for the good. You don't have to live much life. To, all things are not good, right? There's plenty of things that are far from good that we're going to experience in this life. But here's the promise. Notice the promise is directed to whom? To those who are called by God and love, and love the Lord. It's the Bible language for called according to his purpose and love God. That's Bible language for Christians, for followers of Jesus. The promise of a sovereign God, hear this, working all things out on your behalf for something more glorious than you can see, that promise is only reserved for those who choose to love God and serve and be about his purposes in this world. That's a Christian, a follower of Jesus. The promise is for believers. We'll get in a moment to what the implications are for the non-believer. But the promise Paul says is, hey, if you've chosen to love God, he's writing to the church at Rome, remember? A church that he's about to visit. And he says, I'm going to get there, and I want you to remember, can you imagine how hard it would be to be a local church in Rome in the first century? We've covered a lot about the history of Rome. We've covered about their value system, about how Caesar 
felt about his identity, about how the Roman Empire felt. They were the light of the world. They were the hope of all things. They were the provider. They were the one who you were to bow and worship. That was the, right? And here you've got this group of people. Jesus is king. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the hope of all. They plant the flag of the gospel in Rome. Do you think that might have drawn some attention? Do you think there might have been some resistances? Do you think it would have been tough? It would have been hard, really, really hard. And Paul's like, you got to, hey, you young Christians in Rome, you got to remember this, all things. That means whatever decision Caesar's making about whatever he's doing with Christians in the arena in Rome, I know you look at that and go, what, what could possibly come of that? God says, I will work all things together for good for those who love me have been called according to his purpose. That is a promise anchored in a sovereign God. Here's what Timothy Keller says, pastor in New York. He says it this way. If you love God for who he is in himself, you make a commitment and you endure difficulty. But, hear this, if you are using God for what he gives you, you bail out when the suffering comes. So that's what he's sifting through. Saying, hey, if you're all in, then you can hold on to this promise. This is the anchor of the future hope. This is the Spirit's help. And now a sovereign God who has the power and resources and capacity to take unimaginable darkness and bring goodness out of darkness. That's God. That's a sovereign God. Because suffering reveals the deeper loves of the heart. It's been my experience with suffering is that people become more of who they really are in the deepest valleys and the darkest days. You become more of who you really are when you're suffering deeply. And the promise is God will take all of those things and work it together. It's the sovereignty of God that declares things like, I have you, I see you, I know you, and we will work this out for purposes that you may not understand right now, but I promise you I'm going to get the last word. That's the sovereignty of God. The definition of sovereignty is in control of all things and all ways all of the time. By definition, there can only be one capital S, sovereign. And in Rome at the time, that was just Caesar. Caesar believed he was sovereign over all, and his empire was quite large, 4,200 miles for 1,500 years, spanning from England to India. So he had reason to be fairly confident in his declaration of supremacy until the flag of the gospel gets planted in Rome. <laughs> and this little group says, actually, there's a king, capital K, and a sovereign, capital S, and uh, Caesar, one day, you're going to bow. You're going to bow to the sovereignty of this great God. And this is why the scriptures have verses like, I put these in your notes, like Isaiah the prophet. He wrote words like, do you know about Isaiah? Like his life was incredibly difficult. They said of Isaiah that it was most likely the end of his life, he was sawed in two at the order of King Manasseh. That's after about 50 years of prophetic ministry, where for the most part, the people of God didn't turn their hearts to the Lord. He was kind of mainly not seeing a ton of fruit from what he was doing, and at the end of the run, sawed in two by Manasseh. That's Isaiah's journey. Here's what Isaiah wrote, chapter 42 of his uh, book of the Bible, verse 2. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Notice the repeated, when you, when you, when you. Isaiah seemed to grasp that he was going to have a really difficult journey in this present age. But he was also holding on to this. A sovereign God would get the last word. Manasseh thought he got the last word with Isaiah. But the sovereign Lord's going to get the last word. And David said in Psalm 23, often quoted passage, right? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, this is David. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. That's a declaration of sovereignty. The valley seems to dominate. The darkness seems to dominate. And Paul says, actually, no, the sovereign God dominates that place of darkness. He will be with you. You're going to come through this. You're going to get through it. There's going to be more story written. He'll get the last word. That's David. Or how about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? It doesn't get much darker than him being innocent. They're going to free guilty Barabbas. And then he recognizes, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay my life down. They're going to execute me publicly and brutally. And so he cries out in the Garden of Gethsemane. I put that in your notes, verse 39. He falls with his face to the ground. And he says, Father, is it possible? May this cup be taken from me. And then he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. 
And every time I read that passage, I think Jesus asked for a plan B. Anyone come in this morning thinking of your life, hey, Lord, is there a plan B for this situation? Because I'm not liking your plan A. If Jesus asked for a plan B, it helps me understand why I ask for plan B often. Because my preference is not often aligned with what God's intention is. I'm like, I prefer a little less suffering, a little less hardship. I value safety, comfort, and convenience. Those are not top shelf values with Jesus. And right there is why I'm asking for a plan B. And he's like, yes, Simpson, we're on plan A. And of course, you know you've surrendered to sovereignty when you get to the last part of what Jesus said there. He does ask for plan B, which I love that in his humanity, but then he surrenders. He says, yet not as I will, but as you will. That's a surrender to sovereignty. That's God the Son understanding God the Father is going to get the last word. But I don't want us to miss the implication of this for those who don't love God and are not called according to his purpose. If you made a decision to push Jesus to the margin of your life, you don't have anything to do with God, faith, spiritual things, you're just like, you're not sure where you're at with Christianity, I'm glad you're here, I want you to wrestle with it, I want you to wrestle with the sobering implication of this verse for your life. If you choose not to go all in with Jesus, Paul says, it's pretty sobering to think about. That means you're basically saying, here's what, here's for the non-believer, the person who's not a Christian, they cannot rest with confident assurance that a sovereign God is working all things for the good in their life. They cannot. Now, what, what, what often they can do is they can think this, here's the danger of someone who's choosing to walk without God. If your life's going well, do you see how successes can compound the not so good? Because if you're successful, what does it do? It multiplies self-centeredness, self-reliance, and pride. I got this. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. I can handle it. I can navigate life on my own. Do you see the danger of that pathway? But I promise you, if you keep living, you're going to hit a stretch of life that doesn't look as good as it's currently looking. And in that moment, Paul says, if you love God and you're called according to his purpose, you're going to take a future hope. You're going to drag it and anchor it in here. The Spirit's going to bend over to help you, and a sovereign God's going to get the last word. That is not true for someone who does not choose Jesus. And that's sobering, I think. And if you're here, you're listening online, and you haven't made a choice, I think that's something you need to wrestle deeply with. Because to me, it's putting an awful lot of eggs in the self basket. And it seems like the older I get and the longer I live, the more frail self becomes all the time. I'm not nearly smart enough or strong. In my younger years, I maybe thought I was smart enough. The older I get, the, the more I recognize, huh? Sovereign God, i got to anchor myself there because I'm clearly not as in control as I've thought I was. And so, how can, a, how can a Christian face the sufferings of this life? With a confident assurance, right? And an overwhelming, deep assurance that the struggle is going to be worthwhile. Three things. Future hope. The way things are is not the way they're always going to be. Spirit's help. The Spirit's going to intercede in a sovereign God. The Lord's going to get the last word. He has the power and the resources to take all things and bring something. He can bring goodness out of darkness as only a sovereign God can do. He didn't say all things were good. He just says, I'll get the last word and bring something from that. Worship team, if you could come back up, I want to wrap it up with this. At the end of September, I was... Uh, I was in a sequence of funerals, and I had the privilege of doing Meredith Harshbarger's grandfather's funeral. His name is Don. And just five months before that, I had the honor of officiating Meredith Harshbarger's grandmother's funeral. Literally in a five-month span, the same group of people, we were in the same gathering spot at the same funeral home, same setting, virtually the same group of people in a five-month span. And these two, Don and Kathy, just pillars of faith, the legacy they've left with their family, love God, love their family, just amazing, faithful servants. And so it was a very traumatic time in Meredith and her families, just all that that represents, losing a matriarch and a patriarch. Some of you have been in that very journey yourself in the span of just a few months. Well, I was walking out of Dawn's funeral to the parking lot, and I ran into this elderly man in the park, and he was just standing there, and I could tell he maybe wanted to say something to me as I was walking to my car. So a little bit of small talk, he said, hey, um, 
I was in the same church with Don and Kathy. My wife and I, we'd play cards together, small group together, do life together, meals together. And he was by himself, and he just started crying. And he said, I lost my wife recently. He says, I've said goodbye to my wife. I said goodbye to Dawn. I said goodbye to Kathy. He's just crying at this point. And he says, just so hard. I was just listening. And he said, you know, there's one thing. There's one thing at the end of the day that keeps me going. I said, what's that? He says, I know God is with me. And he said, I know one day, because God is with me, that there's going to be a reunion with all those folks who I've loved and enjoyed so much of this life with, that I'm going to be together someday with them. He says, that's what helps me get through this day. You know, as I listened to this man in this parking lot, I thought, that's kind of a, it was a modern day Romans 8. It was like this gentleman's putting words together. It's, it's struggle. It's hard. Life is hard. In this present age, it's hard. It's most likely going to get harder. I mean, this gentleman was in his 80s, and he was just saying, it was harder now than it's ever been, is what he was describing. And it reminded me, you know, Don and Kathy and this gentleman, Don and Kathy, Meredith's grandparents, they said goodbye to everyone in their life. All the grandkids, all the kids, all the great grandkids, they said goodbye to each other. They said goodbye to everyone but one. They did not say goodbye to Jesus because Jesus said, if you choose me, I'll be there in the end. And so I don't know what today, you've come in today and looked at the message title and go, well, will the struggle be worthwhile? And you said, well, that's just a commentary on maybe your whole week or your whole month or your whole year. Romans 8 would tell you, if you choose Jesus, it'll be worthwhile for three reasons. You've got a future hope, you've got the Spirit's help, and you've got a sovereign God. And we plant our feet there. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that in the midst of the struggles, that right now we just want to open up to you. Imagine in this room... For those online, a whole array of that's not the way it's supposed to be is rising up. Someone sat in a doctor's office recently and gotten news they didn't want to get. Someone sat in a boss's office and gotten news about their work they didn't want to get. Someone had a conversation, marriage conversation at the table they didn't want to have. And on and on it goes. And so right now, would you bend towards us by the Holy Spirit? Hear our groans. Anchor us in a future hope with the promise that you're going to get the last word. Take these things that are just not so right in this present age and work it for something more glorious than we can see now. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to wrap up with a final song. And as we do so, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings at this time. We're also a way we can be praying for you. Prayer at eaglechurch.com. Those of you online, we want to be a praying community. You feel free to reach out. If you, it's a confidential matter, you can mark that. It just goes to the pastors. We want to pray for you. We want to be help to you. And then thank you for all of you who give financially. That's the way you can do it online there. Uh, thank you for your continued generosity to steward about God's mission in this world. And then after this song, we're going to have the Bosnia team up here to continue to visual of what a church does, who's connected to Jesus and what he's about in this world. So let's stand together. We worship one final song.
salvation's flame. Christ undefeated, trampled the grave. You see now the cross has lifted high. The light is gone, the light is won. seat everybody. Well I want to introduce you to our Bosnia team. They leave on Thursday. One of our mission partners is Petula Myers in the country of Bosnia. Less than one-tenth of one percent of that country follows Jesus. Can you picture that? You can fit all of the followers of Jesus in Bosnia in this room right here, the entire country. So Petula has been there for about 18, going on 19 years, serving faithfully in a part of the world where this team is going over to partner with her. Encourage them. They're going to do some prayer walking. They're going to have all kinds of ministry with the ministry center called the Izvor Community Center. It's like the Well Community Center there in downtown Sarajevo. Uh, they're going to do some practical life skills training, and they're just going to be an encouragement to the, the believers, the church leaders. It is hard to describe how encouraging it is to the small remnant of believers there when people come from North America and say, well, why are you going to spend eight or nine days with us? And this group's just going because this is what people who follow Jesus do, to pray and serve and help and bless. And so, and how cool is it? We've got a father and son up here, right? You got Ryan and Isaac right here, right? Isaac's in ninth grade, right? Freshman in high school, father and son, right? And then Sarah, Ted's wife, have you met Sarah Harris? She's leading the worldview class, just doing a great job with that. And so Sarah's going. Have you ever been to Bosnia before? First trip to Bosnia? And then Kate Kribo, Kate, this is your first trip? first trip? First trip. And then Bob Everett. And so we can be praying for Bob. Bob continues to care for a wife whose physical body in this life continues to fade away. So he said to me, I'm trusting that 
if the Lord wants me in Bosnia, then he's going to have to sustain a situation here while he's away. And so thank you, Bob, for your willingness to go. We continue to pray for Vanessa and trust the Lord to order your steps. But thank you for going and representing Jesus Church, representing Eagle and being a blessing. We want you to know our commitment is to pray for them, right? They leave Thursday. They're going to be there till the following Friday. So put it on a prayer list. Put it as a reminder somewhere to be lifting this team up. All right, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for this team that's going. Thank you for uh, the good work you've begun in Bosnia. Even when it looks like a mustard seed at times, give this team eyes to see, led by the Holy Spirit, to see what you are doing there and to partner with the work of God there. May the words of their mouth, the meditations of their heart be pleasing, acceptable to you. Guide them, bless them as they serve others, as they help others. I pray that you'd protect them, grant them traveling mercies. Uh, The logistics of this trip, would you just supernaturally cause it to all work well together? And may the team that they serve there and the missionaries and the workers, may that, that group of people, may they leave blessed, encouraged, strengthened, and uplifted from this team's presence. So we commission them now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give a round of applause to the Bosnia team. Thank you. All right, and we've got a missions Sunday coming up November 13th. So there's a lot of mission stuff going on around here. If you want to know what Eagle's about, discipleship, missions, and next gen. A lot of mission stuff going on. We care about what God's doing in the world. We want to be a part of it. And so this team going to Bosnia is going to dovetail right in November 13th. We've got a special guest speaker here. When I heard him at Perspectives class last year, I walked up to him and I said, how do we get you to Sunday morning Eagle Church? That's how much I was impacted by this man's communication and his message, and I think what he's going to bring. So November 13th, I promise you, you do not want to miss that Sunday, and you need to bring some friends. And then I also want to ask you to give some time following the service, because he's giving us an additional couple of hours following Sunday morning, and I think you're going to see why you're going to want to spend time with him after he's here. So if you'll just block November 13th, and a couple of hours after service, we're going to serve you some lunch, and then Todd Aarons is his name, and Todd's just going to, Sunday morning he's going to preach, and then afterwards he's going to have lunch, and he's going to continue the conversation. I think it'll make a lot more sense when you're here, but it's all about missional engagement in the world, and I think, especially young people, you students, that's a Sunday. Bring some of your student friends. I promise you, this man who spends a lot of time on college campuses trying to help college students figure out uh, meeting Jesus this day and age. So November 13th, that's what's going on. Connection lunch is happening right now downstairs in the multi-purpose room. Even if you didn't respond, we've got like 20 some people who said yes, they're going. Join us down in the we've ordered extra food. If you're newer, please join us. Even if you're not newer and you're just wanting to get more connected around here, you've been around here a while but trying to meet some folks, come downstairs, multi-purpose room, we'll feed you lunch, we'll chat a little bit, you'll get to know some folks and talk about some next steps. Um, that way. And then lastly, Carl Ralston and Lori out in the atrium. Love for you to connect with them. Find out about all their ministry stuff. You can become a prayer partner. You can get child sponsorship info. Just encourage them, would you? Even if you're not going to get any info, just would you stop by and give them a high five and thank them for their saying yes and that they're not crazy for doing what they're doing. Can we do that? Let's stand together. I'm going to send you out. Benediction, Romans 15. If you're new here, so glad you're here this Sunday. I hope today was an encouragement to you and a blessing to you. There's a There's a guest central area. You pick up a gift bag on your way out. They'll give you some free stuff. I want to send you out. Paul has a benediction at the end of Romans. It's one of my favorite benedictions in the scriptures. He says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God and Father of the Apostle Paul send you forth overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, declaring this, the struggle will be worthwhile. Go in his name.